biblical times, Shabbat was celebrated very differently from the way it is today. I think it must have been rather like a market day in the rural towns of England about a century ago. People stopped work, but there wasn't a strict cessation of business on the country. Many people used it as a chance to shop around. People used the day also to go for walks to visit holy places and holy priests. And in Jerusalem, most people flocked to the temple. But there was no rigid observance of Shabbat the way we understand it today. Now somebody yesterday, I asked him, when is the Messiah coming? Because it's a secret and nobody knows. And uh, he said to me, he quoted it, that uh, if, if Jews kept two Shabbos, the Messiah will come. But they have to keep it properly. So the idea is, it's written in, in one of our poems, our uh, books, that if the Gentiles, the gentle Gentiles, knew how important the Jew is for the world, they would put two gendarmes, meaning two policemen, on every Jew and make sure that he keeps the Shabbos and he goes to synagogue to pray. Nomi, Nomi, what is Torah? Torah, it starts with the word T-O-Y, toy. It's not a toy, but it is the most marvelous thing to learn and to know. Now, Torah is basically has two meanings in terms of the word. One is the five books of Moses, Moshe, Rabbeinu, and Torah is the bulk of knowledge and interpretation regarding these five books of Moses, which is the pinnacle is the Ten Commandments. Shema Yisrael Adonai Rahim Adonai Echad The Torah is a scroll on parchment rolled over two wooden rollers. And these are rolled from one side to the other as the Torah readings process through the year. And those rollers are called Eitz Chaim, which literally means a tree of life. It is a tree of life to all who grasp it. And that somehow says what there is to say about Torah, which is that it is a living document and it is a way of life. The Torah is not old-fashioned. It's nothing to do with time. It's beyond time and space. And what you saw here wasn't a scroll. It wasn't. It was a living thing. The Torah takes over a year to write by a special person who is devoted to write it and then he has to sit on it and then if something it is a living thing meaning if something goes wrong with it or god forbid something burns it's buried like a person in a in, in with a funeral and a graveyard
when the Torah is read on the Sabbath, the procedure is that the warden stands at the side. Someone reads from the scroll and members of the congregation are called up, are given an aliyah, which means going up, and the reader reads from the Torah. Now this is said to be a kind of reenactment of the theophany at Sinai when God gave the Ten Commandments to the people. Namely, the warden is in the place of God. Some wardens think that they are in the place of God. The reader is in the place of Moses, who is bringing the Torah, and the person who is called to the Torah is, represents the people of Israel who are receiving the Torah. So each week, the great drama is reenacted and brought to life. It records what God has said to the Jewish people from the earliest days. And in studying Torah, we keep that alive by responding to it, by bringing our own insights to it. We are actually responding not only to the words of the Almighty, but also to other Jews down the centuries who've read this, who've perhaps had the same thoughts, who've brought insights to it that they've recorded in commentaries. And so it's actually a collective act that spreads across the world and spans the centuries. Shabbat Shalom literally means, of course, a Sabbath of peace, or have a peaceful Sabbath. And it speaks about harmonies, a coming together, of all the jagged bits and pieces of the week. And in that period of time between sundown on Friday and sunset on Saturday, to find rest, a oneness, a harmony with yourself, your family, your community. May the Lord bless you and keep you and at the same time, so our tradition insists, when you observe this properly, you actually taste one sixtieth of the great shalom that is promised in the messianic time. when I walk back from shul on a Shabbos morning with the children, how everything around me is very busy. The shops are open, the traffic's buzzing, the people are rushing, and I feel as if I'm in a bubble of timelessness. Because Shabbos is above time, and it's special. Shabbat Menucha is not just rest, it's public rest, it's collective rest. You know that you're sharing in an experience which all Jews all over the world are having in the same way on the same day. The work prohibitions extend not only to uh, Jews themselves, but to servants, to animals, even in some respects to inanimate life. It's as if everyone became free that day and all the hierarchies disappeared. When you look at the calendar of a people and you look at the way they order their time, 
you find out a great deal about the way that people uses its imagination. And in the Shabbat, you see a combination of an episode in God's own life, as it were, for God rested from the work of creation on that day. And the other episode is in Israel's history, the exodus from Egypt, and the way that our people attained its freedom. First time I broke Shabbat was when I was taken into the concentration camp. Uh, there was no Shabbat observant because everybody had to work. It was a seven days working week. There was a most ironic inscription above the gateway of every one of the Nazi concentration camps in Europe. It said, Arbeit macht frei. Work makes you free. Of course, these were gateways to death and destruction. And one of the characteristics of the camps was the total absence of the Sabbath. The real truth is that it is actually rest that makes you free. And the Shabbat is that symbol and that reality combined, which tells us that we are not owned by what we own, nor are we slaves to men or economy, but free people who need to work, but can also rest. Kuach Nefesh is the, literally the saving of life, but it is also the saving of suffering because if somebody suffers, their life may be in danger in some way or another. So <clears throat> whatever the laws of Shabbat are and however strict they are, the law of saving a person's life takes precedence over every other law. On Shabbat after Cholent, my parents used to go to sleep and I unfortunately used to have to make my way to my rabbi's house where I went in for extra study. I used to sit there quite upset, looking out of the window at the blue sky and thinking of all my friends at Tottenham Hotspurs or at Arsenal watching a football match. At least for those 24 hours of Shabbos. So in other words, you can look at it... I think it's still the loveliest day of the week as far as I'm concerned. And I remember when I was in the army, the week seemed to go from Shabbat to Shabbat. What I miss out on, I think, is purely and simply the frustration of being an active journalist and knowing that the world is still going on around me. And there is a certain frustration, a certain worry about what I'm missing. What don't you like about Shabbat? Um, you can't watch television. <laughs> in Jewish legend, the wicked are not punished in hell on the Sabbath. So all the wicked rest on the Sabbath from their torments. And as long as there is a Jew anywhere in the world who is still keeping the Sabbath, then they don't return to hell. And that's why pious Jews have been in the habit of postponing the uh, bidding farewell to the Sabbath the latest possible time. I think it's important to realize that Olam Haba, the world to come, isn't just going to arrive from heaven. It's for us to create in a dynamic way all the time, rather like filling in a painting by numbers. And as we do the mitzvot and as we live out our Yiddishkeit, our Judaism, the picture is made complete. I think parents must have an enthusiasm and a love, a motivation and a dynamism they must be excited about their Judaism so that they convey it to their children as something desirable and so that their children want to do it. They want to share in this vividness and in this vitality. 
And so we will maintain the link with the past and forge a link with the future. The first Sabbath was over and the world was dark. Adam thought that his life had come to an end and he would be doomed to live in darkness if he lived at all. But God taught him to take two sticks and rub them together and create fire. And when the fire was produced, he thanked God. He said, Bore me ore haoish, blessed is he who creates fire. In the closing ceremony of the Sabbath, known as Havdalah, which means distinction or division, all five senses are brought into play. The blessing is recited over the wine, which is the sense of taste. One looks at the light that's kindled, so it's the sense of sight. One speaks the words of the blessing. One hears the benedictions. And one looks at the hands because now the Sabbath is over, one is able to work, and that's the sense of touch. Then you have the besamim, the spices. And that is, first of all, because you want to carry the sweet scent of that beautiful Shabbat day into the week. And also because we have a tradition that on the end of Shabbat, that additional soul that we've been given to cope with the special spirituality of Shabbat departs. And just as a person becomes faint and have to be revived by strong smelling salts or whatever, we take these spices and we take a good, strong whiff to revive us so that in the departure of our additional soul, we should be able to remain through to the week. Then it is Havdalah time. I invoke and sing about Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. Because it's a sad time, it's a moment of parting. But Elijah is going to be the one who will announce the coming of the Messiah. And in a way, Elijah is symbol of progress. It means although we're about to go back into the working week with all its toil and difficulties and tensions, sometimes even dangers, there is redemption at the end of that road. And all is not lost. In fact, all is never lost. And so I say to myself, roll on week, Shabbat is on its way again, and who knows, maybe it will be this coming week that Elijah will come, will make the announcement, and by then, of course, next Shabbat, it will be a very different kind of day. You are very, very fortunate that I'm very fortunate, and my friends, that you are here to come and give us a chance to say that there is the most incredible secret in this world and the secret is that the world has to know that we are very joyful and very happy and we want to share it with everybody but everybody is not ready but you seem to be ready because you have arrived here Shavuot Shavua Tov, Shavua Tov, Shavua Tov, Shavua Tov, Agutevoch, Agutevoch.